some people believe the victory over Hitler in some way redeems Stalin's barbarity. Many think he showed real talent as a war leader. I don't find either argument particularly helpful. The important thing is the Soviet people showed astonishing courage in the prosecution of their great patriotic war, and they were rewarded with what? With more of the same. For though the Soviet people won the war, the victor was Stalinism. November 1944, the anniversary of the revolution, at the end of a year when almost all the empire was liberated. Victory was approaching. But several million men and women were in the hands of the Germans. Stalin regarded them all as traitors and dead men. His own son, Jakob, had died a prisoner of war. Soviet prisoners of war starved and died in Nazi camps. Millions were put to work or served in the German army. Some volunteered, some were forced. All were deemed traitors. Three months before the war ended, Stalin played host to a crucial summit in the Crimean town of Yalta. At Yalta, the big three, Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill, met to negotiate the shape of post-war Europe. Churchill asked Stalin privately what he should do about the Russian prisoners still held in the West. The official record says, Marshal Stalin hoped they could be sent to Russia as quickly as possible. The agreement was kept secret. There were 100,000 Russian prisoners in Allied hands. Nearly 20,000 of them, Cossacks who had fought on the wrong side, were held in this camp in Austria. Some were not Soviet citizens at all, but emigres. The British Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, said, we cannot afford to be sentimental about this. British troops persuaded the Cossacks to hand in their guns. When the Cossacks realized what was happening, there were suicides. Men shot their families, mothers drowned their babies. Allied troops put thousands onto trains and handed them over to the Red Army. And many loyal Soviet prisoners of war fared little better. When they started organizing our departure, we all rejoiced. The war was over. We were going home. The Americans gave all the Soviet troops a little suitcase with clean linen. But we didn't get to keep them, of course. There was a bridge we had to walk over. We saw secret police troops standing on the other side. We climbed off our train. We saw what was written on the side. Traitors to the homeland. Drushkov was accused of spying. He got ten years. Vilna, former capital of Lithuania, which has been successively occupied by Poland, Russia and Germany, has been virtually destroyed four times by war, which has periodically swept over it in its turbulent history. As the war ended, the Red Army liberated millions of people from German occupation. In official newsreels, they welcomed the Red Army, but most waited to see what would happen. In the fields and forests of Lithuania, partisans had been fighting a guerrilla war against the Germans. Now they turned to face a new enemy, the occupying Red Army. Casimir of Arcalete was one of those determined to fight on. The Russians arrived. We'd already heard about their government. They'd done terrible things. There was nothing good about them. 
Our men didn't want to join their army. We wanted to fight for Lithuania, not for the Russians. So our men went into the forest. They set up a resistance group. Clad in motley uniforms, armed with captured or discarded weapons, the partisans played a deadly game of cat and mouse with Soviet security troops. Kazimiera Varkalete was confronted one day by Soviet troops searching for partisans who were hiding under the barn. They started throwing off the logs to try and find the bunker, but I was quietly throwing them back on to cover the air pipe which was now sticking out. They noticed I was throwing the logs around and said, if you're hiding bandits here, you'll die with them. No, there aren't any here, I said. Finally they left. I ran and told the partisans what had happened. Did you hear anything? No, they said nothing. We were asleep. The one-sided struggle went on into the 1950s. Sometimes the bodies of dead partisans were laid out in town squares. University lecturer Albinas Kentra has never forgotten the sight. Mothers come and look at their sons and they cannot show these are their, their sons. They would be arrested. After the war, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia and Moldavia became Soviet republics. Eastern Poland was incorporated into the Ukraine. May Day, 1949. The Red Empire now equaled the Empire of the Tsars. The new Tsar Joseph Stalin, who had masterminded the victory over Hitler, now called himself Generalissimo, great leader and teacher, father of the nation. His position seemed more secure than ever. I believe that Stalin was the greatest person. Everybody else is just tiny, petty people. Some parents, by the way, told their kids that you should first love and respect Stalin, then your parents. It, it, he is your father. When Marina Young was a schoolgirl, no one ever dared criticize Stalin openly, even within the family. March the 5th, 1953. The supreme leader and teacher, father of the nation, Corypheus of science, Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin, was dead. It was a personal tragedy, and we heard it on, on radio that Stalin died, and I was just uh, crying, and I just uh, couldn't believe uh, that it happened, and it f I felt orphaned. And there was a meeting uh, at high school where I, uh, I was, and during that meeting, a boy standing next to me smiled, and I started to beat him, uh, and uh, somebody had to hold me, because I just couldn't believe that you could smile at that day. I remember sitting up all night in front of the window, which looked onto the Kremlin, and thinking, what will happen now? And then suddenly about four or five in the morning, a brilliant thought crossed my mind that nothing could be worse than it has been. <laughs> and I felt very, very happy. Joseph Stalin still dominated Soviet life. Khrushchev wrote, For three years we were unable to break with the past, unable to muster the courage and the determination to lift the curtain and see what had been hidden from us about the arrests, the trials, the executions and everything else that had happened during Stalin's reign.
One evening in February 1956, the Reuters correspondent in Moscow had a visit from an agent of the KGB. He offered John Retty the scoop of the century. He arrived in my flat. Uh, we put on loud music, <clears throat> just in case of the microphones. And he then began to tell me this amazing tale uh, of Khrushchev denouncing Stalin as a murderer and a torturer and an absolute devil incarnate. Uh, I didn't know whether to believe him or not. It did fit with the rumours we'd heard in embassies and so on. And uh, this fellow did have some credentials from giving me information before. So we decided we did believe it. And when I would go out to Stockholm the next day, I'd take the notebook burning holes in my pocket on the plane and file it from Stockholm. Gathering in the Kremlin, the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party springs a surprise on the world. Joseph Stalin, the man who ruled Russia for a quarter of a century, is publicly criticized for the first time. The critics include Premier Bulganin, his predecessor Malenkov, and Party Secretary Khrushchev. Khrushchev and his colleagues tell the delegates that for 20 years the party has suffered in all its work from one man rule. Now, they announce, collective leadership has been restored and wider party democracy is promised. It was Khrushchev who pushed through what came to be known as the secret speech. His son-in-law remembers the reaction. There was dead silence in the hall. At first, everybody was just shocked. After some time, once it had sunk in, you could hear cries of shame, disgraceful. The old communists were crying. Khrushchev was standing here when he was handed a note which read, How could you members of the Politburo allow such grave crimes to be committed in our country? Khrushchev read out the note and glared down the hall. This note is not signed. Stand up the person who wrote it. Nobody moved. The person who wrote this note is frightened, said Khrushchev. Well, we were frightened to stand up against Stalin. Young people were inspired by Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin. They decided it was time to join the party. It provided a much needed transfusion of new blood. Khrushchev mobilized their enthusiasm for a crusade to tackle the chronic food shortages. As so often with his plans, it was supposed to offer an instant solution. He looked to the east, to the so-called virgin lands of Kazakhstan and western Siberia. Khrushchev called on young communists to help turn the steppe into the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. Politburo member Leonid Brezhnev was put in charge. But the virgin lands were not as empty as they looked. The Kazakhs, persecuted and collectivized by Stalin 30 years earlier, once again stood in the way of Moscow's imperial plans. They took our horses away from us, and we couldn't live without them. Without the meat, without their milk, but they didn't listen. They wouldn't let us breed anything, not a single cow or horse. Their only aim was to grow corn, which was no good for us at all. So you see, he didn't do any good for Kazakhstan. The managers of collective farms were bombarded with a bewildering barrage of directives issuing from the Kremlin. Stepan Olyenik was chairman of a collective farm in the Ukraine. No, us was no our main crops had always been wheat and sugar beet, but he wanted maize. Maize and China millet and Russian dandelion. Basically, he'd chosen everything you can't grow here. We ended up with no bread. Then they decided to destroy our grass crops. Orders came, no sowing of any grass crops. The whole thing was hopeless. We didn't have any say in what was going on. 
потом ели. Я не знаю, как сейчас мы до хозяину и все до чего. In October 1957, the Soviet Union astonished the world by being the first to put a man-made object into space. A tiny satellite called Sputnik was successfully placed in an orbit 200 miles above the Earth. Everyone soon knew its call sign. I was never bombarded with so much propaganda as the morning when I got up and heard the news about the first Sputnik. Everywhere in the capital, every street, they had these banners in the shop saying, we are first in the world. We have surpassed America. Robert Robinson had been living in the Soviet Union for almost 30 years, but when it came to Sputnik, he was still a foreigner. Just come to you and say, have you seen my, the Sputnik? We have surpassed America. How you like it? Or they would see me about passing me. They would say, beep, 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 beep. Just like the Sputnik was, you know, passed whenever you, you, you heard, beep, beep, to call my attention. Как не радоваться успехам наших людей, хотелось бы крепко обнять этих замечательных товарищей, которые своим трудом и творческим гением прославляют нашу советскую родину. greatest achievement came on April the 12th, 1961. The first cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin lifted off from the Soviet Space Center in Central Asia. A hero of socialist labor in the 1930s remembers the space hero of the 60s. When our darling Yuri Gagarin walked into our lives, he seemed so extraordinary. What he did was an achievement for everybody. You see, Yuri always said that his flight was not just down to him personally. But so many people had worked to make it a success. He was so grateful. I can't explain how we felt. There were crowds all over Red Square. Everybody was shouting, our Yuri in space, our Yuri, who will be next? It was such a triumph. We were so incredibly happy, as, as though you'd made the flight, as though I had. It was a joy we all felt. Khrushchev basked in the reflected glory of Gagarin's flight. Eventually, Khrushchev's successors would have him erased from the photographs of the occasion. At the 22nd Party Congress in the summer of 1961, a young Mikhail Gorbachev, attending his first gathering, heard a confident Khrushchev applaud the achievements of the party. The new party program proclaimed that socialism had been achieved. Communism would arrive within 20 years. 